It's a tragic reality that people go missing, vanishing under mysterious circumstances never to be heard from again. While they mainly occur in commonplace locations, some are linked to places of intrigue like the Bermuda Triangle or the Aoki Gahara Forest in Japan. That's the suicide forest. Look it up. But even more compelling is when those individuals reappear. And while it's a cause for celebration, what if they return with no real recollection of where they were, how they got there, and how they managed to return? This next story is about one such individual whose disappearance and reemergence enthralled an entire nation and remains a mystery to this day. This is extremely strange. There are mysterious areas of the world whose boundaries are identified as resembling triangles. The planet is dotted with them, and each is considered unto itself a place where strange occurrences are part of the norm, the most famous being the Bermuda Triangle, but there are others in Massachusetts, Alaska, and Vermont. One of these is perhaps lesser renowned, but it stands shoulder to shoulder with its more famous cousins, and that is the Lake Michigan Triangle. It first gained attention back in 1891 when a schooner, the Thomas Hume, set course across the lake for its home in Muskegon after unloading a cargo of lumber in Chicago when it literally disappeared overnight along with a crew of seven aboard. No trace of the ship was found until 2006 when a recovery diving team found its remains in relatively good condition in the southern part of the lake. It's been estimated that between 6,000 and 8,000 ships have been claimed by the Great Lakes, with approximately 30,000 lives lost. Because of its sheer size and atmospheric conditions, the lakes are subject to their own weather patterns that often give rise to severe storms that certainly account for a large percentage of tragedies. But there are also reports of UFOs and other strange anomalies in the region, which only add to its reputation as one of the more oddly intriguing places on Earth. One of the more peculiar incidents related to the Lake Michigan Triangle began on February 20th of 1978, when 23-year-old Hope College senior Stephen Kubacki set off alone on a cross-country skiing journey. The excursion was thought to maybe take a day or so to complete, but when Kubaki didn't return as planned, his family became concerned as to his whereabouts, and a search for him was launched. On February 23rd, a break in his apparent disappearance came when a group of snowmobilers came across a set of cross-country skis along with a backpack near an old seminary and contacted authorities who immediately assumed they may belong to the missing student they were looking for. It was then that the search was expanded to include aerial reconnaissance. Now a little background on Steve. He was born in Deerfield, Massachusetts to a lower middle income family. His father worked in a tire plant and his mom was a secretary at the University of Massachusetts. As a youngster, he attended the prestigious Deerfield Academy as a day student before moving on to the conservative and Christian-based Hope College in Holland, Michigan. He was described as a brilliant student with a free-spirited nature and a bit of radicalism about him, but he was a very engaging guy, and one of his classmates at Hope College referred to him as sort of a Dungeons and Dragons guy. We all know one. He was something of an outdoorsman who, while studying abroad in Europe, was known to scale the occasional mountain there. He also met a female professor while in Germany and fell in love with her. His cross-country trek wasn't unusual as he'd done that type of thing before. He was on schedule to graduate from Hope in the spring with the promise of a job at the Holland Sentinel, 
a newspaper in the town the college was located. The search for Kubaki turned up empty, save for a 200-yard trail of footprints in the snow that skirted the edge of the lake, which simply ended there. With nothing else to go on, investigators reached the conclusion that Stephen had likely gone into the lake, had gotten trapped under the ice, and drowned. There were also fears that he may have been another victim of famed serial killer John Wayne Gacy, who was operating in that general region. But in the absence of his body, and with no other explanation for where he was, much to the distress of family and friends, he was declared legally dead and received his bachelor's degree in German studies post-mortem. His parents had even hired a private investigator to look into their son's whereabouts, refusing to believe that he had met a cruel fate. But his efforts turned up nothing. And this is where the story takes a most amazing turn. On Saturday, May 5th, 1979, almost 13 months after his disappearance, Kubaki turned up incredibly still alive. He later claimed to have woken up in a meadow in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, his home state, over 700 miles from his last known whereabouts. He further claimed no memory of anything that had happened between his disappearance and his reawakening with no concept of the time that had passed. Only a newspaper he purchased made it clear that over a year had elapsed. He made his way to an aunt's house in Great Barrington, where eventually he reunited with his family, who lived some 20 miles away, where he rang their doorbell and literally returned from the dead. One can only imagine how joyous that reunion was. When the press caught wind of his literal return from the dead, he was contacted to tell his remarkable story and perhaps make some sense of his extended absence. He told reporters that when he awakened, he was wearing clothes he didn't recognize and wearing an unfamiliar backpack containing various maps along with items indicating he'd been to places like San Francisco, Utah, and Chicago. This suggested he had traveled extensively, but he nonetheless could recall none of it. He was also in possession of a small amount of cash, wearing new glasses and sneakers, along with a t-shirt from a marathon race held in Wisconsin. He claimed he felt as if, quote, he had done a lot of running, and that his last memories were of feeling cold and lost, staring across Lake Michigan. Kubeki surmised that this loss of time and memory was the product of exhaustion and exposure, and he would seek out a medical examination. When the subject was broached about a psychiatric evaluation, he balked at the notion, claiming he felt he was in a very sound state of mind. Now, the last part of that story is a bit odd, because while he seemed to have a clear understanding of his situation, he must have realized how bizarre the circumstances were surrounding his return. But yet, he didn't acknowledge any potential psychological trauma or the need to talk about it. I don't get it, but that was his call. Now, he claimed he wanted to return to Saginaw to essentially retrace his steps and try to determine what exactly had happened to him. But reports are that that endeavor yielded no answers for him either. Around 1983, Stephen received a master's in linguistics from Ohio University with a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of New Mexico. During his stay there, he was awarded a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship in the Departments of Philosophy and Psychoanalysis at Frankfurt University in Germany. He was last known to have moved to the Pacific Northwest with his wife, where they both are adamant about maintaining their privacy, and he rarely, if ever, speaks of the incident, but has been the subject of a number of stories and documentaries detailing it. Stephen has gone on to write a book called Metamathematical Foundations of Existence, Godel, Quantum, God, and Beyond. Now, the story of Stephen Kubacki definitely has a happier ending than most missing person cases. He happily returned to his family, embarked on a career in academia, 
And by all indications, he's right now living his best life. No real answer has ever come forth as to what happened to Stephen Kubacki over that 14-month period of his disappearance. And that, of course, has fueled wild speculation as to what took place there. Everything from interdimensional travel to alternate universes to alien abduction. Some speculate that Stephen just had a mental health episode and essentially checked out of reality for a while. It seemed like he had a lot going for him. His father was going to sign over the house to him. He had no academic problems, no relationship issues, and he had a job waiting for him at the Sentinel upon his graduation from college. Did prolonged exposure to the elements result in a form of temporary amnesia, or did they trigger an existential journey? It's unclear whether or not Stephen has even entertained those possibilities. Or perhaps he does know and just doesn't want to revisit it. And that's fine, but it'll never satisfy the people who worried about him during his absence or those who spent months trying to find out where he was. Having it happen so close to a place of mystery like the Lake Michigan Triangle will only continue to fuel wilder speculations. But in the end, Stephen returned to us. And let's hope that in the future, others who have gone missing will end up like him, walking amongst the rest of us.